it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Bloody Bones and Green Eyes Samuel L. Clinton, Sam C. to his associates and customers alike, tramped down the trail that led to the driveway of the Travis Broxton family. That would in turn lead to Farm to Market Road, 1988, and from there to his friend Wu's house, where he'd left his car. It was a long walk after dark, but worth it. Broxton's extended family was in town, some of them had decent money and had been willing to part with it in exchange for some first-class blends of a certain THC-producing plant. Well, he and Wahoo had worked on the blend for years, and it was infamous in the area. He was, of course, stoned out of his gourd, but hey, he had to party with these suburbanites and yokels to get them fired up to buy all that he'd brought. He managed to collect $250 profit from the relatives and was feeling satisfied. It even fed him, and one or two of the girls had shown some interest in slumming with him, and he'd definitely be back tomorrow night. As he wove his way through the brush, he thought he heard a noise, or noises. Not loud, but all the other night sounds had stopped. He looked around and saw nothing but shadows under the bright moonlight. He was about to cross a small clearing full of goatweed plants and grass. He'd have to stay on the path to avoid the bull nettles. Those things hurt like fire, and he'd have to piss on the affected area to get rid of the sting. So he'd been told as a child, and he swore by it. His mind was still foggy and wandered. It rushed back to the present when he saw a large shadow move, and then a head stared at him from out of the tangle beneath the trees. Large green eyes gazed at his own and held him transfixed. And then they blinked. It broke the spell, and he picked up his pace couldn't be more than 200 yards to the driveway. He remembered this track. He recalled the clearing. Once he made it to the road, he'd be safe. He stumbled along, his high rapidly fading along with his remaining physical coordination. His fear morphed into panic when the eyes appeared in front of him, and he heard the rush of a large body in a roaring scream. His hindbrain, a feature left over from generations of evolution, knew that sound as had his primitive ancestors. It caused the release of all bodily functions that were not critical for survival. It didn't matter. The mess in his britches was the least of his worries. Sam C. was on the ground and dying before he could let out a scream of his own, the result of which was a feeble, mewling sound, all that he could manage. Uncle Jim spoke in his low, raspy voice to the enthralled family members and friends especially the children who encircled him around the bright campfire. He just finished telling a tale that ended with bloody bones and green eyes, which elicited some intakes of breath and squeals of not quite fear, yet the little ones clamoured for more, supported by the adults who'd always loved his campfire stories. He sat back for a moment, scratched his beard and pretended to think. Hmm, well now. This one ain't all that scary, but you might like it, since it happened to me and happens to be true. When I was a young'un, the old folks shared all kinds of strange stories, and many of them featured cats, especially black cats. And at this, he leaned forward and raised his eyebrows and bugged his eyes to the delight of his audience. I was walking, well, to be honest, stumbling drunkenly, back home from Maidan's beer joint near Black Cat Ridge. They caught in an ice house. I guess that sounded better to some folks. Tiny little place. They always had fresh catfish heads mounted by the door. Don't know why. Made the place stink. Maybe they wanted people to throw up so they'd buy more booze. He waited as the crowd made bath noises and cheered him on. Well, that night, I'd had a good long taste of Lefebvre's Folly, a local moonshine. So I was in a merry mood and enjoyed my moonlight stagger. It was a really bright full moon that night, made for spooky silver shadows, especially along the little dirt road that wound through willows covered in drooping Spanish moss. I jumped. He said this last word with emphasis, and raised his hands and grasping fingers. Uncle Jim's stories weren't always scary, but his behavior, as he told them, invariably was. 
when I heard a loud and deep hoot, 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 hoot. Ah, it was just an owl, but in the dark and by myself like that, it sure scared me. My first thought was, ghost. I heard a woman scream off in the distance. I knew better, though. That was a cougar. Good thing, though, it wasn't far away, and if it was prowling, chances were that the other big critters and booger bears would hunt elsewhere. As I walked up to the little bridge over Ben's branch, though, I got a funny feeling. A sort of chill down my spine. Like a spook was nearby. Hardly anybody used this old dirt road and wooden bridge anymore. It was scary, even in daylight. As I was about to stop out on the feeble old bridge, I saw a figure in front of me. It sat right in the middle of the bridge. It was a big old black cat. Not a panther or cougar, mind you. Plenty of stories about them big ones. But big, maybe like old Melvin, my black lab. It had huge, green, glowing eyes, and the moonlight made the whole thing kind of shimmer and shine. It blinked its eyes at me and then... No kidding. It spoke. He went quiet and waited for it. True to form, one of the younger children asked, What did it say, Uncle Jim? It said, Follow me, darling. In a voice like that of an old woman. Then it swirled away and jumped off that bridge. Now, Ben's branch was swollen. It was springtime and rainy, so... So anywhere that cat would have landed would have caused a splash, but I never heard one, nor saw it neither. Now I knew that cats weren't supposed to speak, at least not in human talk. So I up and decided to walk the main road. I'd just have to suffer the extra distance and risk the laws catching me drunk and taking me to jail for the night. Now a talking cat ain't all that spooky, but the next day I found that the old bridge had finally given up and fallen into the branch that night. If I'd walked on it, well, wouldn't be here telling tales. The moral to that one is that black cats don't always mean bad luck. Sometimes they're just a warning. There was general applause and Uncle Jim excused himself as another family member brought out a fiddle and others brought out various instruments and began an impromptu concert. One of the older boys, mid-teens, approached Jim as he left the campfire circle. TJ, Travis Jr., sidled up to his great-uncle. He didn't say anything. He just walked alongside the elderly man. Jim stopped out of the circle of light from the fire and started to urinate. The act no longer held any embarrassment for him since he was pushing 80. TJ shrugged and then emulated his older relative. Jim didn't mind. He'd worried some for the boy who lost his father last year. Natural for him to cling to elder men in the family with his dad, poor Travis Sr., gone. Oh, awful ending. Getting eaten by a sounder of saber-toothed hogs. Jim realized that if he was going to figure out what the boy wanted, he'd have to ask. So, TJ, how are you and your ma and your sis doing? TJ shrugged. All right, I guess. It's been hard on ma, though, having to work while Cassie and I go to school. I turn 16 soon, so I can get a regular job and help her. I've been helping with farm work and odd jobs when I get them. He trailed off. Clearly he wanted to ask something, so it was Jim's turn to wait. Uncle Jim, I looked into Black Cat Ridge. What do you said about the moonshine? Jim cackled a little. Yep, homemade corn liquor. Repulsive stuff. Stunts your growth. DJ looked down clearly in thought, then looked up a little startled. Oh, I didn't want any. I was just thinking about the people who've been there for a while. Dad didn't talk about it until just before he went down to help with the feral hog problem. He said the place could be nasty with the swamps around it, and even more with the people who live nearby. It was hard, but I found out everything I could about what had happened to him. Well, I'm proud of him for trying to help. Jim patted his shoulder. Well, TJ, I'm sure proud that you know how to research. For all that he played the hillbilly, your dad was a bookworm when no one was watching. He laughed a little at the fond memories of Travis Sr. 
Now, how about we get back to the others and scrounge up some grub? TJ nodded and smiled. He'd found the approval he'd needed, and since he was 15, food always interested him. The rest of the family packed up the next day. It was Labor Day weekend and most of them had to be in work or school on Tuesday. There were many hugs and handshakes and promises of, we'll talk to you all soon. TJ and his little sister, Cassie, watched as Uncle Jim, the last to leave, started to pile into his old pickup truck. Uncle Jim, thank you for all the stories. Sure was good to see you, TJ said a little shyly. The old man grinned his yellow teeth contrasting with his white beard as he stretched out his hand for a manly shake. TJ, glad to see you growing into a man like your dad. He was my favorite nephew, even though he was the youngest. Nobody can miss him as much as you and your sister do, not even your mother, well, in a different way. You all keep looking out for one another, and if you need anything, you holler. Owen, don't go looking for the wild hogs outside the, uh, intranet. Well, the children assured him they would not, and Cassie gave him a big arms around his waist hug. He climbed up into the cab and was soon a receding plume of dust as he headed down the dirt road that led to their home. The gatherings had been held here at the old farmstead property since Jim was a boy. The property had been in the family for longer than that. It was still pretty far from anything, just a small gas station town. Well, they now had an off-brand dollar-something store that was somewhere between a grocery and a convenience store, what the old timers called a whatnot store, and they had a feed, seed, and hardware all in one. That wide spot in the road was six miles from their place. The nearest town of any size was 30 miles. TJ gave his little sister a playful and very gentle shove. You ready for school? Gonna be a freshman. A fresh woman, that is. He grinned at the last. Cassie rolled her eyes. Yeah, how about you? You'll be a senior. Mr. One year ahead of everyone else. Soon to be employed, hotshot. TJ's grin widened. Ready as ever. I really want to get done with high school. He trailed off as they approached the front porch. Hey, I'll be back in a little while. Want to go walk down to the pond and clean up some of the mess the cousins made before it rains. Tell Mar I'll be back soon and I'll take care of cleaning up outside the house. Cassie nodded. Okay, you gonna take your gun? TJ shrugged. Nah, got my big knife, and it's just a little walk. Not staying long, and with all the people we've had running around, nothing will be lurking at the pond. Besides you. She stuck out her tongue and then dashed inside the house. They were lucky to have one another these days. It had been almost a year since their father had died. He'd gone to help hunt down some saber-toothed hogs and had become one of the uh, heroic figures to perish under the teeth and hooves of those monsters. The sheriff down there had sent him a photo of the head of the beast that was now mounted in his office. There was a plaque beside it that read, P.I.G. Pride, Integrity, Guts. Dedicated to those who went forth to serve and give their all. He hardly considered it a prized possession, but he understood that the man had meant well. His mother had almost vomited when she'd seen the photo on his screen. That thing had killed and eaten her husband, the father of her children, the love of her life. TJ made it to the large pond and began to make his way around it. No doubt some of his idiot cousins had sneaked beer or dope out into the woods, They'd have left the litter near the pond, and sure enough, in the clearing around their old fort were several empty beer bottles and a few butts from cigarettes and blunts. He'd left a trash bag tied to a nearby tree, but none of the refuse had made it inside. He gathered it all and set down the bag. He really wanted a few minutes to himself. He skimmed a few rocks across the otherwise still surface of the old cow pond as he processed the concerns of his life. Then he noted an odour. Something foul. Not overwhelming, but fresh. The odour of recent death. Travis Sr. had raised his son to hunt and track and to pay attention to the woods around him when they were outdoors. The coppery scent of blood, the foul stench of open viscera, 
and the gamey smell of a dead mammal caught his attention. He paused to check the wind direction and then started walking upwind in search of the source of the stink. He found the general area from which the scent had originated but saw no carcass until he looked up. In the crook of a tree was lodged a body. Not a deer or a hog as he'd expected. This mass of necrotic flesh and clothing had been a person. He recognized only the bloody jeans as clothing. The rest of the remains were mangled and stained with dried bodily fluids. He backed slowly away from the tree. He looked all around to ensure that the predator wasn't nearby. He knew better than to run, but it took every ounce of his self-discipline to keep his feet moving at a moderate pace. At the pond, he paused to pick up the trash bag and then increased his pace back toward home. Along the way, he was sure that something tracked him. No, paced him. He caught glimpses of a dark sheen out among the shadows and trunks of the pines that surrounded the area. At one point, he could have sworn he'd seen a pair of eyes flash at him. Large, green eyes. The figure was lost from view as a small tree with leprous bark obscured it for a moment, and then it was gone. The feeling of being stalked evaporated, and TJ hurried in earnest, not quite running to his home. Well, he hadn't wanted to tell his mother, but he had to. She handled it better than he'd feared, though he'd hated to cause her more grief. She got on the phone and the sheriff's office soon had a deputy on the way. After a few more calls, everyone who'd attended the gathering was accounted for, so at least no one from the family had been harmed. The big deputy arrived, and TJ took him out to the site. This time he carried his rifle and the bowie knife his dad had given him for his 13th birthday. It was late afternoon, but they had plenty of sunlight left. When they arrived at the death tree, TJ remained alert and looked for his erstwhile stalker. And then he noticed that the tree was empty. There was still gore on it, and it still reeked of mortal remains. I know this is the right tree. You can see the blood. He gaped in confusion. The deputy eyed him suspiciously. He'd looked askance at the boy when he'd insisted on being armed, despite being in the presence of an armed deputy. The kid and his mother had cajoled him into digging in the trunk of his car and taking along his issued AR. Now, oh, TJ, corpses don't get up and leave. You know this area, no doubt. What you've reported is very serious. But we can't have people calling and wasting our time. What kind of game are you playing? You've never been a problem, kid. TJ just looked astonished. Is this dude blind or just lazy? He had to ask himself. I'm sure. Let's please just take a look. I know what I saw. And my dad taught me not to lie, especially to the laws. His dad had also taught him tracking. And in the shadowy light of late afternoon under the canopy of the piney woods, he circled the tree in search of signs. There wasn't much to be seen among the leaves and pine straw, but there, clearly drag marks that led deeper into the woods. He pointed. There, that's where something dragged him out of the tree and into the deeper woods. Look, you can still see the blood and other stuff on the tree bark. And Deputy Briscoe looked, but was clearly unconvinced. Ah, it's just some leaves moved around, and yeah, that looks and smells like blood, but, well, something sure stinks, but... How do I know it's human blood? Without some proof, we don't need to be wasting any time out here traipsing through the brush. But without a body, we don't have any evidence. TJ found himself again, looking astonished. So, you aren't going to do anything? Maybe take some samples or photos. The deputy rolled his eyes. I'll get the evidence tech to come out tomorrow and get a sample. But in the meantime, let's get you back home. You all stay out of the woods until we can get back in good daylight. TJ quickly snapped a few photos on his phone and accompanied Briscoe back to the house in sullen silence. Well, Travis Sr. had never held much faith in the local constabulary, and TJ was picking up the same attitude. He 
He groped to his mother and sister for a while, before they had supper, but there was nothing else really to do. They all settled in and prepared for the first big day of school. Hopefully Deputy Briscoe could find his way back to the tree with the evidence tech. Well, TJ's hopes were dashed at about 4am the next morning. It started to rain. Then it started to pour. The water was still coming down in buckets when he and his sister boarded the school bus. His heart sank as he plopped into his seat. He had a rain slicker and umbrella, so only his shoes and the cuffs of his trousers were wet. Soaked, he thought glumly. No way the sheriff's office would, okay, to be fair, could send anyone out to gather blood that would no longer be there. This wasn't some TV program where crime scene techs would bring out a mobile lab and have the mystery solved in less than an hour. He was right. His mother sent him a text to tell him that Deputy Briscoe were called to cancel, and they'd try again when the rain let up, likely tomorrow afternoon. All that day he was distracted. He barely spoke with any of his friends, just brooded in corners during breaks, all the while trying to puzzle out who the victim could have been and what exactly had killed him. He had no answers. There had once been black bears in the area, but no one had seen one for years. Cougars were back, but they just weren't all that big and still very rare. Maybe a booger of some kind. His dad had told him that those were just stories, but he shouldn't disrespect people who thought they'd seen such things. <laughs> a mixed message. Hmm. What did he actually know? One party was unwilling to let him sulk. His best friend, Will. Will's dad, Billy, had been Travis Sr.'s best friend since childhood and had perished along with Travis Sr. The men had hung out together, so naturally, so did TJ and Will. Will was a year younger than TJ, who was the old man of their group, along with Cassie's best friend, Natalie, who had a definite crush on TJ. They were normally a tight-knit group. TJ was annoyed when the trio joined him at the lunch table. Will started in first. So, no idea who the body was. TJ looked up, not at Will, but at Cassie, and glowered. You know you weren't supposed to say anything. It could mess up the investigation. Cassie just rolled her eyes. Seriously? Because old Fat Briscoe says? Will and Natalie are best friends. If we can't trust them, who can we trust? TJ pursed his lips and sat back clearly determined to be stubborn. Natalie placed her hand on his and said softly, Travis. She always called him by his name, which he secretly liked. You know that none of us would tell anybody outside our circle. We want to help, to be there for you. We believe you. Oh, those eyes, like some cartoon Disney princess, TJ thought. He considered for a moment more, and then shrugged. Oh, you'll get it out of me sooner or later. Look, I have no idea. We accounted for everyone at the gathering, so it's either some local or someone passing through or someone who was brought in and killed. Maybe killed and brought in, but there sure was a lot of fresh blood and other stuff. He swallowed the bile that rose at the memory of the odor of... Oof, and he shivered. I figured that I'd ask Briscoe or one of the other deputies if anyone was missing. Chances are that he didn't check because he didn't really believe me. He just knows that Sheriff Green will kick his ass if he doesn't do his job in a, at least a half-assed way. Will sniggered. Yeah, old Briscoe is lazy and dull, but not so stupid as to get caught being lazy and dull. You think it was anyone we know? TJ shrugged. That's the half-million dollar question. The other half-million is, what exactly happened to that person? They spoke on until lunch was over, and by the end of the day, TJ was actually tired from the stress of thinking about it, trying to solve a puzzle without all the pieces. He went to bed early and had some disturbing dreams. He was sat out in the woods again, and his stalker was back. It was dark this time, and all he could see was a large shadow skulking inside the tree line as it paced him. He tried to go faster, but the shadow shape kept pace. He decided to make a stand, so he stopped and turned toward the source of his nightmare. From within the shadows emerged large, gleaming, glowing green eyes. 
The eyes blazed into his soul, and he shuddered as they grew closer and larger, and as they came upon him, he felt the hot breath of a large creature, and he heard a scream in the distance. It sounded like a woman's scream, like his mother or sister, or Natalie. Yes, it was Natalie with her own big eyes, screaming into the night. And then he was awake and breathing heavily, the nightmare images fading into the warm darkness of his room. And he started as the scream became reality. He could hear, out in the woods, a woman's scream. And he scrambled out of bed and into the jeans he'd laid out for school. He slipped on his boots and looked up, startled as his door crashed open. It was Cassie. She held her little two two three rifle. TJ picked up his 308 and set it on the bed. Did you hear that? She shook with fear and anxiety. What the f... She trailed off when her mother appeared, carrying TJ's old 20 gauge. I heard that, Cassie. We'll worry about that later. Did you all hear the scream? TJ rolled his eyes and raised his voice. If there's anyone else in the house... Yes, everybody in the house heard that. The last bit of grumbling was distorted by the t-shirt he pulled up over his head. Look, Cassie, will you spotlight for me? Mom, I need you to cover me. It sounded like it came from the back of the house, so let's start on the back porch. He snatched his rifle from the bed and checked the load as they trundled downstairs. He opened the door cautiously and shone his small but very bright light out into the darkness toward the woods. Nothing. He stepped out. Cassie closely crowding his heels with one of their father's big handheld spotlights. Once he was in position on the porch and the rest of the team flanked him, Cassie turned on the spotlight and shone it into the trees. Just shadows. Either of you see anything? He asked without taking his eyes off the branches and brush shrouded in the darkness. Cassie spoke first. No, I think there's someone out there in the woods. So... And at that, she was interrupted by another scream, this time followed closely by a yowl of some creature in pain, much closer to the house. They stood for a while, but no more sounds burst from the woods. The rain started again, light this time but steady, and they gave up their vigil to try and get some sleep. Something was definitely haunting the woods. Terry Ann ushered her brood inside and sent them back upstairs. Needless to say, firearms would be kept close, and it was unlikely that anyone would sleep for a while, if at all. Wahoo shook and cowed as little Luther loomed over him, taking up an inordinate amount of space in his tiny, filthy living room. Little Luther, who was not little at all, stood, fist-balled and glared at the smaller man. So you're telling me Sam C. took all of what I gave you to sell over that Broxton party thing? who stared for a moment in abject fear, and then stammered out, Yeah, he took all that was left, along with our blend. He said he'd call you. Little Luther nodded. Yeah, he freaking called me. Asked for some fresh pills to sell to those Broxton kids. Said he made 150 off pills, and it had guaranteed $500 sale for Saturday night. And then, nothing. Where the fuck is he? You two assholes party up my stuff? And at that, he edged just a little bit closer, and the smell of the rotting food between his teeth filled Wahoo's nostrils. Wahoo spread his hands to indicate haplessness, and to be ready to fend off the rain of fists he expected at any moment. No, we didn't party at all. Sam C. heard about the party over there, went to sell some favors, maybe chase a little white-tailed ear. I... P I fell asleep waiting for him. He never showed. Then I saw the laws over there Monday evening. That Broxton kid, TJ, walked around with that fat deputy, Briscoe. Little Luther frowned. Then what? Why are the laws looking around? Well, who tried to crawl up into himself? I don't know. I just watched, but, well, they walked into the woods. Little Luther produced an evil smile. Well, Wahoo, well, looks like you and me are going to take a walk in those woods. 
Little Luther couldn't believe that the two jackholes would have tried to stiff him. They never had before, and he was sure they were too scared to start. Then again, Samsey had been hinting lately that their homegrown blend made enough that they might not need to sell the pills that Luther surprised. Dangerous thinking on Samsey's part. He and Wahoo tramped along the muddy trail that led onto the back part of the Broxton place. They knew that Mom was at work and the kids were in school, so neither worried about anybody seeing them or saying anything if they did. Nobody messed with little Luther King. Yet he still didn't want to draw any unnecessary attention, so he'd parked his car just around the next curve in the road from the Broxton's driveway. They could easily have walked, while whose trailer was just around the next two curves after that, and on the other side of the road. But little Luther liked to drive. He liked to show off his ride to the locals. Wahoo stumbled along behind him, and cursed aloud at every trip and tumble. These were frequent since he hadn't cared for going into the woods since he'd been frightened as a kid. Something about big green eyes that he'd told his parents. They neither cared nor believed him, despite his night terrors and return to bedwetting, those just got him more thumps from his father. He'd taken his first illicit drugs to be able to sleep. Little Luther was about to turn around and tell him to be quiet when he realized that he hadn't actually heard the fool for the past few moments. He stopped and looked back. No sign of Wahoo. He called out in a low voice, Wahoo, get your ass over here, fool. No response. Now a little angry, he turned back along the trail he'd just covered. He was going to smack that dumbass around a little, maybe knock some sense into him. Had he paid attention, he might have noticed that Wahoo's tracks in the soft wet ground stopped and then headed back toward the road. He didn't need to see them, though. He knew that Wahoo had freaked out and fled. In his peripheral vision, he caught a glimpse of a large, dark form. What the f... was his fitting, final utterance, as he heard the primal scream and felt the sting of large claws grip his arms and shoulders. And before he could even scream, the fangs that sank into the back of his neck rotated and snapped his neck. He never managed another inhale of breath. Wahoo tripped and stumbled and fumbled his way back along the trail. He couldn't believe what he'd seen. That cat thing. It had sat inside the trees and stared at him. Just stared with those ginormous green eyes. Then licked its chops with a big red tongue. He hadn't even thought about warning little Luther. He'd just bolted like the coward he was. He'd run so fast that he hadn't had time to make his normal noises. He heard the predatory scream, intended to momently freeze prey and make it vulnerable. He ran right past little Luther's park car and on down the road to his crappy little trailer house. When he arrived, he locked himself in his room, squatted on the floor next to his bed and shook and cried. It had to be a bad trip. He had lied, of course. He had been high. He was always high on something. Those pills, that scream... Surely little Luther would arrive soon and beat him to a pulp. But at least he won't eat me, he shivered. While he spent a miserable afternoon in his miserable little hovel. TJ was anxious to get home. Will was coming over and they were going out on a hunt. There was something stalking the property. Cassie would cover for them if their mother came home early. Not likely, but they'd be ready. As the bus slowed on the last curve in the road before their driveway, he saw a car parked over on the shoulder. A gaudy thing. He'd seen it parked at Wahoo's trailer a few times. Wahoo was a piece of crap druggie who lived down the road. Reasonably harmless, just trashy. Now his friend and oftentimes roommate Sam C was a full-fledged turd. Hmm. Weird place to park, he thought. Never know what dopeheads were thinking. When they made it home, TJ helped Cassie set up supper preparation. She was a good hand with her little rifle, and had her dad's eye for tracking, but keeping mum unstressed was more important than her pride or her skills. Will rolled up about a half hour after the bus dropped them at their home. 
He rode his own dead father's four-wheeler, and had a 12-gauge shotgun slung in a long holster on the side of the vehicle. He wore his rubber boots and a floppy hat. His dad had left him with the name Billy, embroidered on the brim in bright green letters. He treasured the goofy thing because it had belonged to his father, who died alongside his best friend Travis Sr. on Black Cat Ridge down south. He grinned. Something else he'd gotten from his father. A little crooked to one side, but sincere. His humor was a good counter to TJ's sometimes taciturn nature. Ready? Looks like we'll get some more rain before we get back. We'll hide the slate gray clouds scuttling overhead. Maybe if we get ahead of it, we can find some tracks. TJ simply nodded and hefted his 308. Take care, Cassie. Hopefully we'll get done and get back before Mom gets home. If not, we're at the fishing pond, right? Cassie shook her head. Nope. TJ looked at her, annoyed. It was a dumb lie, but one they could fade. What? She rolled her eyes. You may need these to be convincing. She reached around the corner inside the house and out of sight of the two boys, who stood in the yard, and brought out a pair of fishing poles, which she held up triumphantly. TJ rolled his eyes, but thanked her. Will's grin widened, and he eagerly thanked her and praised her foresight. TJ rolled his eyes again. They each checked their weapons, and then set off toward the pond and forest and the fields out back. The two-legged things didn't smell very good, at least at first. Yet they were starting to grow on him. He was getting old, and tangling with feral hogs or chasing deer had become more of a challenge than he liked. Well, the taste was similar to pork, but the outer skins often stank and were inedible. The big one today had been tasty, and the leftovers were now safely stored in the crook of a tree, deep inside his territory. He had been taking a nice nap, but in the distance he had an annoying buzz. One of those things the two-legged creatures rose. The young hunter might return. Well, he didn't feel much like it, but decided to take a stalk around his perimeter. Not hungry, but he was feeling a little angry and protective. Too many two legs in his territory over the past few days. Boyce first looked around the pond and the blood tree. There were still a few rusty patches and streaks on the trunk, and in the crook where TJ had seen the bloody mess resting, and just a little bit of the stench remained in the air. Even the rain couldn't wash away everything at once, yet nature would soon take its toll. Once the weather turned, insects would quickly devour and remove the evidence. Will's eyes grew wide when he saw the bloodstains. He believed TJ, of course, but seeing human blood from a dead body was novel and a bit unsettling for him. It wasn't the blood itself. I mean, he'd hunted and worked around livestock long enough to be inured to the mere sight and smell. No, it was the knowledge that this blood had once been liquid and had coursed through the veins of another human being. He felt a few goose pimples arise as TJ picked out a pathway that led toward the back of the property. TJ seethed. The deputies should have been out here as soon as it stopped raining. If he and his friend could slog through the wet woodland, so could they. Of course, it was his family's land, so he didn't mind the hunt. He just wanted to know who the victim had been. Maybe someone with a family, he worried. He couldn't help but think of his own father and Will's. They'd been killed and eaten by wild creatures. Maybe some kid or kids were sitting at home waiting for their parent to return. They needed to find and stop their own threat from the wild. The trees had stopped dripping, but the overcast sky had grown even darker as the boys reached the back fence line. He hadn't really spoken about it, but TJ had taken the lead and had a search pattern in mind. Billy trusted his older friend. He knew just how intelligent TJ was, even if he brooded and grouched at times. The trust between them was as solid as it had been between their fathers. TJ noticed it first. The shadow that paralleled their path. The creature that paced silently along beside their own squelching noisy steps glided from cover to cover, never fully visible, but never fully absent. 
He looked over his shoulder at Will and said quietly, You see it? Out to the left? Will nodded and kept up the pace. Both boys considered alternatives. If they stopped, the beast might attack or simply disappear once more. If they ran or quickly changed direction, it might attack. Or they might lose sight of it and then it might attack. TJ slowed to walk beside his friend. Let's just get the guns ready. When I give the signal, we turn and fire at the best target. I know that goes against hunting safety rules, but it's hunting us as much as we're hunting it. Once we fire, we advance together toward the target, like our dads taught us. He intended the last of his statement to hearten the younger Will, and it worked. TJ moved out ahead again, and then obviously clicked off his safety as a signal. Will did the same, and both of them turned in unison and raised their weapons to where the threat had been. It wasn't there. The shadowy figure had disappeared altogether. After a few heart-pounding moments of waiting, each lowered his barrel and they turned toward one another. TJ spoke in his normal tones. Maybe it knows what guns can do. He didn't finish. A large black and grey streak of fur engulfed them as a thunderous roar sounded and the hunter and prey tumbled across the forest floor, indistinguishable from one another. Will stood motionless for just a moment, and then the panic seized him. He aimed his weapon at the massive cat that was mauling his best friend and fired. The buckshot tore into the flank of the beast, and it screamed in its higher-pitched tone, it leapt into the air and turned on him as he attempted to load his next round in the pump of the shotgun. He instinctively pulled back the firearm as a defensive weapon, taking it from a firearm to a club. He felt himself rise into the air, hovering on his side for a moment, as though he rested on an invisible couch. Then he quickly hit the ground and felt the burning scratches along his lower left leg. The big cat had swatted him as it ran past, he now lay on the forest floor in shock and pain. He heard the sharp bark of TJ's rifle and stayed in place, stayed low as his friend angrily rose and stalked in the wake of the enormous feline, all the while pumping rounds after the monster in a vain attempt to follow his plan and take out the beast. He bled from a tooth mark on his forehead and from several other wounds about his body. He was clearly bruised and battered, but he was also furious. Will was almost afraid of his best friend in that moment, of the boy who'd rescued him from bullies and... Oh, crap. At least two of the wounds on TJ's size appeared to be from the buckshot. Oh, God, I shot TJ, he wailed in his mind. Then the pain in his leg truly set in, and he realized that it was more than superficial scratches. TJ picked up his groaning buddy in a firefighter's carry. Will would have to keep hold of his shotgun on his own. TJ would need every ounce of strength just to carry and balance him. He gripped his own rifle, now depleted of ammunition, and therefore nearly useless in both hands, and trudged along the trail at best speed. He kept looking around as best he could in case the big cat returned to finish them. Apparently Will had done some damage with the shotgun, but now that he'd started to calm, and the first rush of adrenaline had started to burn off, he started to feel the effects of his own wounds. Somehow the cat hadn't completely shredded him. He'd gotten his rifle up and between the teeth, and Will had acted pretty quickly. Still, it had hit him hard and his claws had raked him. He'd need a new rain slicker. Naturally, it started to rain as they reached the pond. Terry Ann was furious with both of them, but worried and terrified at the same time. So much for keeping her stress low, TJ thought. She'd been home when they arrived. TJ exhausted and bleeding, Will bleeding and unable to stand. It had almost been too much for her, but she gathered them up and Cassie helped as she piled into the truck and drove to the small city and its pretty decent university hospital. She'd had to call Will's mother on the way. They met at the emergency room and clung to one another while their sons were patched up. 
Will had two younger siblings, and his mother, Cheryl, was even more frazzled than Terry Ann. They were barely making it, and now he'd gone and had his knee all but destroyed. It would take multiple surgeries to repair it, and she had no idea how they'd pay for it. She sat on a small sofa near Will's bed while her two younger children slept, a little head on each of her legs. Terry Ann and Cassie sat on the sofa on the opposite wall, near TJ's bed. The same room for convenience. Among other things, they both need to speak with the state game warden about what had attacked them. Terry Ann rose and let Cassie stretch out on the sofa. She padded across the too cold room and took a seat in the chair next to Cheryl. They'd been friends along with their husbands and the kids, but they hadn't seen each other as often since the men had been killed. There just wasn't time. Well, they'd gotten insurance funds and GoFundMe money, but with maintaining homes and raising children, things were often tight financially. This latest incident had them both on edge. So they'll think it'll take four more surgeries to fix him. Terry Ann spoke softly to avoid disturbing the children. Cheryl simply nodded and held back tears. The boy said it was a big black cat. They decided to take it on like their dad's. Terry Ann trailed off in her own attempt to hold back the screams of pain and fear and anger that wanted to burst from her tortured mind and soul. She called a few family members. Now her phone buzzed to alert her to a new text. She rolled her eyes and Cheryl looked at her questioningly. Uncle Jim says he's on the way and he'll go stand guard at the house. Might as well. God, these hard-headed Broxton men. TJ watched in horror as once again the luminous green eyes grew to enormous proportions and the giant black beast swatted him back and forth between his paws. The claws that looked like long curved saws that dug into his side with each swat and with each transit between the paws he spun dizzily. Then the cat rose and swallowed him whole. His view switched to the front porch of his home and there was Will, seated in a wheelchair, his legs missing and his face and body scarred and torn. His wounds began to weep blood, and he looked up at TJ accusingly as the weeping turned to torrents. Uncle Jim made a call once he'd packed, loaded his pickup, and gotten underway. Edwina, this is your father. Oh, I'm all right, sweetness, but there's been an incident with your cousin, well, second cousin, Travis Jr., I mean, the one they call TJ. Some kind of big cat. Maybe the cryptid type that's hoarded the backwoods for centuries. Probably a good idea to send at least an exploratory crew. But I don't get around in the woods as well as I used to. The boys claim that they hit it with buckshot. Likely just pissed it off. Sorry, I know you don't like that word, sunshine. Anyway, I'm headed that way. Kick it around and please let me know. Love you too, Blossom. He drove on into the darkness anxious to get to the old homestead and protect his kin. So you uh, knew that there could be a predator out in those woods, and you didn't tell anyone, just made patrol notes. Sheriff Troy Green didn't raise his voice, but Deputy Prisco knew that he was in for it. If he lied and got caught, he'd be fired immediately. If he told the truth, well, he'd take a hit, likely a suspension without pay. Well, sir, I didn't really believe the kid. There was some blood in the tree, but I thought he was probably just imagining things, and it was just some animal. There was no sign of a body. Oh, then it rained, and, well, after that, I just forgot. There were no more reports, and I didn't think the tech could get much after the rain, and so... Uh... He trailed off weakly, fitting since the response was weak. The sheriff sighed. TJ emailed me the photos he took with his phone. Barney Fife could have seen he was telling the truth. But we'll deal with it after the crisis is resolved. We need all hands on deck for the moment, even yours. First thing is to secure the area around the attack. And we need to notify all the residents in the area to be on the lookout for a large predator. Possibly an escaped big cat. We already have people working on finding out whether anyone's missing such a beast, and we have some experts from Parks and Wildlife on the way. 
I truly don't have time for this, Briscoe. You have no idea how thin your ice is. Now, get with Sergeant Norris. He's on the notification to tell. Look alert and concerned when you tell people about this. They need to take it seriously. TJ was young enough to cry openly and sincerely. Well, I'm so sorry. I got you into this. It's so bad. I don't know what to do. You are a hero, though. You saved my life. Will looked up, bleary-eyed, with pain medication and other fluids being pumped into his body. Yeah, but I shot you too. TJ suppressed the absurd laughter that rose through his tears. <laughs> Only a couple of pellets. And those were outside the ribs. Yeah, it hurts, but they'll make cool scars along with the claw marks. You mainly hit that son of a bitch. He leaned close and whispered. Now, it's my turn. I'm pretty sure I missed with the rifle, but I was too shaken and pissed to shoot straight. They won't let me join the hunt, but they can't stop me from following it. He rose and winked at his friend. Please get better and I'll make sure to do some overtime if, when I get a job, to help your mom. Will managed one of his famous grins and shook his friend's hand. You know, you saved me right back. I couldn't have made it out on my own. Take care of it. <laughs> Take care, TJ. Uncle Jim stood from the rocking chair on the front porch and set aside his shotgun as the pickup came to a stop. Cassie leapt out of the passenger side and looked back and forth, confused. She wanted to run to her great uncle, but she needed to help TJ. She settled for, Hi, Uncle Jim. Thanks for coming. In the end, TJ helped himself. He moved a little gingerly, but he was young and athletic, so he managed and waved for Cassie to go. Terry Ann lingered to see that TJ made it, but had already learned that he wanted to get by on his own and not have his mother hovering over him. Just like his father, she thought, as fresh tears threatened to well up and trickle down her cheek. Tears of love and pride. She watched as the young man climbed the stairs and greeted his great uncle with a handshake and a man hug. She winced along with him though Uncle Jim was clearly careful to avoid the bandages as much as possible. I told you, young youngster holler, if you needed anything. The old man admonished the youngsters. TJ smiled a little. Well, I hollered when that big booger cat hit me. And Cassie assured the septuagenarian. I would have called Uncle Jim, but in the rush, I left my phone here at the house. With that, she registered a horrified face. She hadn't been able to chat with her friends, with Natalie. And she ran into the house without another word. You two sit here and visit. I'll get supper started, Terry Ann told the... Well, she had to think it sooner or later about her boy. No, man. TJ, don't stretch the truth. Cool wounds and scars tell their own tale. And with that, she entered their home, glad to have a task in mind to keep her busy and to avoid her rushing thoughts. TJ took the porch swing while Uncle Jim resumed his seat in the old rocking chair. So, you've met Green Eyes, Uncle Jim half-asked, half-stated. TJ nodded. I didn't know it had a name. So you already knew about that thing. You didn't think it might be uh, important to warn us? Uncle Jim shrugged. Nothing to warn about. You likely met a descendant of old Green Eyes. New Green Eyes, if you will. Oh, he killed the other one, your grandpa and me. First real predator I ever faced. <laughs> Wasn't the last. My point is, no one has seen one around here since we killed that one over 50 years ago. It took to Eden cattle, and Pa was afraid it would take to Eden young'uns. TJ relaxed. I'm sorry, Uncle Jim. I didn't mean to snap. It's just... Jim nodded in return. It's tough, TJ. You went up against a big cat and fought it to a draw. Your friends hurt, and you blame yourself. Rightfully so, at least in part. 
cause plenty of problems for others as well. With that and, well, with losing your dad last year, being worried about finding work, it's a lot to ask for someone your age, at least these days. Plus, I'm sure the pain is a little distracting. Hey, anything new on Will? What's his prognosis? He altered the subject to give the kid at least a little break. Oh, he's going to need multiple surgeries, and even after that he'll have a limp for the rest of his life. I don't know how his mom's going to be able to pay for it. Her insurance is crappy, so's her job. Oh, there are three kids. I'm going to give her at least half my paycheck. The other half has to go to mom. I'll just put school on hold. He paused. Yeah, that should be the last thing on my mind. Ah, oh, but there are all sorts of thoughts, ideas and plans running around in your brain at the moment, Uncle Jim said with understanding. Never know what thoughts will intrude under stress. He looked up as an official-looking SUV approached. Oh, it took him a while to get started, but here comes the warning. Oh, the experts will be here shortly, then the hunting party. Oh, won't that be fun? TJ had never asked what Uncle Jim had done for a living. The stories were variant and myriad among the family. He thought that it must have been something interesting, since he was exactly right on the list and order of official visitations. The young one issued a low, triumphant growl and partially closed his eyes in satisfaction. The old beast was dead. The one that had beaten him in his territorial challenge last year. He lay there, frozen with rigor mortis. The young hunters had indeed found their marks. Yet the old one managed to make it to his favorite sleeping tree. At least to the foot of it. The younger animal cast about, but didn't like this place. It smelled too much of the two legs. Creatures in which he'd had no interest. Unless they came his way for a fight. Oh, he'd fleshed out in the past year and had come here looking to make a new challenge. The old one had made it easy. Wahoo was hungry. Almost as bad as when he'd been a kid and under punishment. He was long out of the other drugs, so he'd spot the last of the special bland on hand. Now he had serious munchies, yet he was afraid to go outside. There'd been some stale crackers in one of the cabinets. Nothing in the fridge but some beer and rancid butter. He was miserable and worried for Sam C. He was glad that little Luther hadn't returned. <sighs> Asshole. Hope that green-eyed monster with the red tongue got him, he thought resentfully. He hadn't eaten enough to crap his pants, but he expelled gas in a loud fart when there was a sudden pounding at his door. Oh shit, little Luther's back. Oh, he's pissed, he's gonna... These things raced through his mind until it registered what his visitor was actually saying. Sheriff's office. Deputy Briscoe. Come on, Wahoo. Sam C. One of you must be here. Wahoo made his way to his feet and stumbled over to the door. He opened it a crack and peeked out into the bright midday light. Uh, uh, hey, officer. Uh, can I help you, man? He sputtered out in confusion and redoubled fear. Fat Briscoe, as the locals called him, stood at the crack of the open door. Oh, don't worry, you ain't in no trouble. There's an animal attack just down the road. We're letting everyone know to stay inside until we can catch or kill the thing. Wahoo considered what he'd heard. His thoughts moved at high pace, so the deputy was almost to his car before Wahoo was able to come to a conclusion. Oh, the jail had food. He stepped out and waved at the deputies retreating back. Uh, hey, um, yeah, officer, I mean, deputy. Briscoe barely heard the tremulous voice behind him, but he had to turn to get back into his car, so he saw Wahoo out in the yard, vaguely waving and saying something. What is it, Wahoo? Wahoo stopped, unsure what to say. He desperately wanted the deputy to take him to jail, that was over thirty miles from here. Maybe he'd be safe from those glowing green eyes. I mean, um, it's like 
Sam C. and another guy, yeah, um, Luther. Yeah, they went into the woods over the, um, uh, yeah, that Broxton place. And I haven't seen them since. Sheriff Green, Sergeant Norris, and two officials from the Parks and Wildlife Department crowded onto the porch to hear T.J. tell his story firsthand. Uncle Jim remained, still seated firmly in his rocking chair. Yeah, let the youngsters do the standing, he cackled to himself. Sheriff Green spoke to T.J. Mr. Broxton, looks like you and your friend Will barely escaped alive. Would you be up to showing us where you found the body and where you were attacked? Uh, we'll have a strong, well-armed party to protect you and our tracker and his dogs. At this, he indicated a man who stood over by a pickup with a trio of leashed hounds. Yeah, the dogs will be on hand to find the animal that attacked you. You're absolutely certain what you saw. DJ nodded. Yes, sir. It was a cat, no doubt. It had to be around nine feet long. Oh, sure felt like it. Thing weighed a ton. At this, he grasped his ribs. Are you sure you'll be able to do this? The sheriff asked, doubtfully. TJ nodded again. Uh, yes, sir. Look, Will's laid up in the hospital because I took him out into the woods. I owe him my life and... I'm just sorry. You know, the ribs are bruised and, well, yeah, cracked, but not really broken. Everything else is bandaged tight. I really need to help with this. To tell the truth, I plan on going back out behind your group no matter what you said. I want to take down that killer. I have a family to protect and revenge to get. Yeah, I know it's not personal with animals, but Will's unlikely to walk right for the rest of his life. He'll always have some pain. I don't know why this thing came to us, but I want to help put a stop to it. Sheriff Green offered him a tight smile. Ah, yeah, good enough. We'll be moving slowly at first anyway, and from what you've told us, it's not too far. By the way, you can take that big knife on your belt, but no rifle this time. The rest of the party will take care of that. The game warden and the large animal removal specialist had remained relatively silent, but the expert now spoke his piece. This may be an old cat, one that can't hunt anymore. Could be escaped and not afraid of humans. No zoos or listed shelters have reported a missing black panthera genus, but sometimes private owners lose interest in them as pets or lose control and don't report it. <sighs> Too many illegal owners. They wrapped up the planning session and took off towards the pond. Cassie sat on the front porch with Uncle Jim, each with a firearm across the knees, ready to guard the homestead. Jim was proud of the young'uns. Travis Sr. and Terry Ann had raised them well. TJ pointed out the blood tree, and the tracker took his hounds around it. They took off down a game trail, and shortly... Inside of a stand of brush, they found some shreds of clothing and a gnawed human skull. The sheriff approached the pile, the expert in tow. The fussy man squatted near the corpse and examined it closely, despite the odour. Definitely Pantera, but I've never seen anything quite like it. Looks like a panther or jaguar on the first examination, but the radius indicates something larger, like a tiger. Sheriff Green squatted next to him and reached for a section of the pants. It included a back pocket and, miraculously, a wallet. An even greater miracle, the wallet contained an ID card. The sheriff stood quickly and used his phone to call the dispatch center. After greeting the dispatcher, he asked, Have there been any new missing persons reports today? The lead dispatcher took over the call. Funny you should ask, boss. I was about to call you with this one. Deputy Briscoe called about a young man from a location just down the road from where you are, a little over half a mile. Wahoo reported this from his friend Sam Clinton, a.k.a. Sam C., and a man named Luther King. Both are missing. I can preliminarily confirm that we found one of them. There's an old school ID with the name Samuel Clinton. Now... Keep that under wraps until we confirm and notify next of kin. If Briscoe is on hand, please have him report to the Broxton residence and wait for us. 
The sheriff wrapped up the call, and the tracker led off with the dogs once more. TJ had pointed toward where he and Will had been attacked. The tracker wanted the dogs to try and pick up the scent of their own. If the cat was still up and moving, they'd find it. Worst case, there'd still be plenty of scent trace left at the scene of the attack. Maybe even a blood trail. Before the party got moving again, a shot rang out from within the group and everyone jumped and readied their various weapons. Each hunter looked around quickly to discover the source of the gunfire. Sergeant Norris raised her face, then quickly looked towards Sheriff Green. That was me. She pointed at the ground with the still hot muzzle of her AR. There lay the writhing corpse of a large copperhead. The reptile had been coiled and prepared to strike the large animal expert as he'd knelt to tie his shoe. Sergeant Green nodded. Good shot, Sarge. Now, everybody breathe. In short order, the track had moved out ahead to the attack scene. The hounds didn't need to circle. They immediately picked up on the scent of the killer and bayed in excitement. They led the hunting party each of whom held a weapon at the ready, to the base of a large hardwood tree. There, stretched out before them, was the carcass of a huge cat, stiff and with its once baleful eyes torn from its head by scavengers. Its tongue protruded from one side of its mouth, and flies swarmed all around it. It was indeed just over eight feet in length and quite heavy. Some of the hairs around its muzzle had gone white, the expert advised, It was definitely an old cat. Definitely Pantera genus, but otherwise unfamiliar. He placed a rag from his pocket over his mouth and nose and bent to look more closely. He looked up at TJ. Well, young man, looks like the animal was hit in the ribs with shotgun pellets, but at least one large caliber rifle round entered its torso. He pointed. Here, that was the kill shot. Not immediate, but it likely didn't suffer for long. Sergeant Norris's keen eyes had spotted more human remains in the main fork of the tree. TJ was soon free to return home for some much-needed rest, while the others remained and processed the scene. The tracker was no longer needed, so he and the hounds escorted the young man home. When they arrived, Fat Briscoe was seated on the porch in a folding chair and talking with Uncle Jim. A scraggly figure sat in another folder next to him and chewed hungrily on the last few bites of a sandwich. Two girls sat in the porch swing, his sister, gun across her knees, and Natalie, Disney princess, eyes glowing with admiration. TJ awakened from a troubled sleep. He'd taken some pills for the pain in his ribs and had fallen asleep on the couch in the living room. His sister had been sprawled back on the same piece of furniture, down near his feet. Her head was now forward, and her eyes were open and alert. Natalie had been curled up on the recliner, and now sat up and looked around in confusion with a hint of fear. They heard voices out on the porch, and then in the distance. They heard again what had awakened them. The call of a big Pantera genus cat on the hunt. Well, another fantastic, fabulous, wonderful, wonderful story there from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit that I set up so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all to you. Oh, I love that one. Fantastic. Kept you on the edge of your seats, didn't it? Well, it did me, and I hope it did the same for you, because you've just spent an hour of your time with me. Still awake? Some of you nodded off to sleep, yeah? Eh, it's all good. Either way. Well, I love that one. Uh, more to come very, very soon. What day is it? It's Wednesday, isn't it? Well, tomorrow I'll be over on my second channel. If you're not subscribed already, then please join me. And back here again on Friday. Not sure what with yet, but something lovely and delicious for you all. <laughs> well, until then, very, very sweet dreams, and bye bye.
Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.